Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Cesar Garcia, and I'm the founding director and chief curator here at the Mistake Room. And I organized um, Ed Clark's exhibition, A Thousand Lights of Simon, which is his first institutional monographic show in LA. Um, for those of you that are new to our space, the Mistake Room is a nonprofit arts organization uh, with a focus on presenting the brain to audiences here. Um, uh, the work of artists living and working outside of the United States are artists who spend a significant time of their formative sort of years um, practicing outside of the country. So we do have a pretty um, international focus in terms of our program. And it's really an honor to have Ed with us today. Um, I was fortunate to meet Ed through an introduction by AC Hudgens and David Hammonds uh, a few months back and decided that we definitely wanted to bring his work um, to Los Angeles. Uh, Ed's exhibition is part of two shows for our fall season, and it, for us, bringing Ed's work here to LA was a really interesting opportunity, particularly at a time when there's this resurgent interest in abstract painting. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, the LA County Museum of Art has a, a show that's looking at abstraction. In a few weeks, the Museum of Modern Art will open another show. And we were interested in visiting some of these histories, some of these distinct trajectories of abstraction that are less known for audiences here on the west coast of the United States. So that's sort of a little bit of the context of bringing Ed's work here to the Mistake Room. So thank, thank you, Ed, for being here. Um, we, we are incredibly honored to be able to present your work here. So for those of you that don't know, Ed Clark uh, was born in New Orleans, uh, moved to Chicago, and uh, served in World War II. After the war, Ed um, enrolled at the Art Institute of Chicago for a few years and then moved to Paris in the late 40s, early 1950s. And Ed really sort of developed a unique approach to abstraction for those who can see the paintings on the wall. Um, Ed paints a lot of it on the floor using a push broom and was one of the first artists that really was looking at or using shaped canvases and shaped forms when looking at, at, um, yeah. at abs sort of at abstract techniques. So Ed, I'm going to start in, in. I'm going to start us in Europe. I'm going to. I want to. I want to ask you a little bit about why you decided to leave the United States and move to Europe in the 1950s. Like, what? Why did you decide to go? I, actually, I was right here at the Art Institute, and there was a <clears throat> there was an Asian guy who had been to Europe. I didn't even know you could go. Right? Nobody told me. And he said, well, you ever thought of going to Europe? You know, uh, boom. Took a lot of red tape for some reason. So, you know, and, that's where I started. And when you, when you got to Paris, why did you decide to go to school? Did you have friends that you knew there? Or did you know anybody when you arrived? No, I didn't know anybody, but I began to, with this, with this, I'll tell you what though. All of a sudden, there's this movie, American in Paris, even though that was shot somewhere else. And I'm saying, I'd like to go to that place, right, you know. And there I was, and it was a lot like that in, in American in Paris. <clears throat> However, when I got there, it was a January the 29th, and I was, let's see, let's see. January, it was cold. And no matter what you did, you know, the chief hotels, that's, that's where most of us went. But no matter what you did, you couldn't get warm. So early in the morning, they had a way of getting you out. I mean, so you're paying for the hotel. Then the, the heat goes off completely. So you had to get your butt out of there and go to the cafe to keep warm. And I'm wondering, you know, this went on for like four or five weeks. And I'm saying, you know, I don't know. I, I saw the, the the thing about the great artists, and I met a lot of. And, and I said, and then one day it got warm and sunny. I was in love with that city the rest of my life. I've never seen anything like it. I could feel of it, right? And neither French people. Yeah, I'm not French, but I mean that's the great French race. You know. And you, you went to school, you enrolled in school when you went to, to Paris. Can you tell us a little bit about... Well, one reason, uh, because I was in the, in, in the military during the war, they gave you, no one knew that while the war was on, that you'd get four years, mm -hmm. right? Now, the four years, if you qualified. If you qualified, you could go to Oxford or a trade school. 
you get the four years, right? You know, well, you can. <laughs> so I chose art, right? Now, I'd been to too much school anyway. I'd been in the Art Institute, and this guy, uh, Russian ancestry, Louis Rittman, he was older than me, and he had uh, lived in, well, he'd lived in uh, not Giverny, but somewhere, all that, right? And he knew I was something special, right? He would say, you know, talk to me a different way, right? But I didn't think much of this. I could always draw, right? But I didn't think much of a lot of people. I didn't really know what it was about, right? But I could draw better than everybody. So, <laughs> so forget that, you know. I mean, when, they, when I decided to take drawing, they had this teacher who told me to draw something. I was drew, drew better than what he had was trying to do, right? So I had that kind of talent, you know. What I didn't like, though, in the Art Institute and those days, you could not take, you had to start out, you know, uh, the, the figure drawing, or still life drawing, this kind of drawing, other kind of thing like that. And, uh, uh, but what, one of the best things, though, that educated me was, after a while, is I took art history because I knew nothing. I'm from Chicago in general. I mean, nobody knows anything. And there was, uh, you know, the book Art Through the Ages with uh, Helen Gardner and, and, and her companion. And I couldn't get enough of that. I'd go every Friday and, and just listening to them. It was dry as hell, but they knew what they were talking about. They had been everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I couldn't wait, and I didn't know nothing about history or art, right? I mean, so I'm listening to history. Mm -hmm. Just get one of their books, you'll see that. I, I mean, they were really, they did it old fashioned. They've been all over, they must have money. But, you know, they've been everywhere, and they, they didn't even have slides then. They had some kind of opaque projector mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I would just be sitting, waiting for the next, you know, in one room. I heard about. Da Vinci, I heard about Michelangelo, I'm trying to put it together right, and you know, it, that was great education. And in Paris, was the education different when you got to school Oh yeah, in by Paris? the time in Paris, because not only that, back to the Art Institute anyway, Louis Redman, who knew it, that I was special, you know, and they just wanted me to go there, right? He, he was, he's not born in America, I think he's born in Russia. But they, they, you know, that was the focus then to be in, in Europe. Not now at this kind of time that people are not going to say go to Paris. But at that time, I couldn't believe it. And when and you, then I'm on the GI Bill, see. <laughs> when you were in Paris, your contemporaries, your friends, you met a lot of people. You met Yao Kusama. You were our friends with Donald uh, Judd. No, I didn't meet her there. I met her in New York. In New York. And Joan Mitchell, you met in, in, in Europe. And, and Paris, yeah. She... Who else? What other artists were living there at the time the, that you? Well, uh, they were. When I'd go to the Cafe Dome all the time, I'd see Jack Abetti at night, you know. They, he'd be stone drunk. That don't make him a bad artist, right? But he would be, <laughs> I mean, you know, he's from Switzerland. And, and, and the, the first night there, I'm looking there, it just happens to be there was a Chagall. Yeah, yeah, Chagall. And he would be, I'd see him in, occasionally in, in the Cafe Dome, right? And you know, it's, Paris is strange, it's not strange. Nobody in the cafe will go up and ask for an autograph. They don't do that. I saw the existentialist woman, whatever her name is. She'd be sitting there, right, you know, and all kinds of people. It had to point them out. That was Paris. And, uh, you know, it was far ahead of Chicago. I didn't know New York then, right? And, and when you got to Paris, was it in Paris that you started painting on the floor, or was that in Chicago? How did that happen? Was it, in, was it when you were in Paris? No, but let me tell you, ain't nobody to this day paint on the floor but me, <laughs> hardly. 
It, one of the things about painting on the floor is you can do things that you cannot do if you try to put it on the wall. Well, look at these work. Look at that painting there. How could I paint that thing on the wall when it's wet? It would drip. So gradually I got into just letting it look and then fooling with it, right? You know, but I knew, I knew everybody, you know. And why did you start, sh yeah, you were painting on the floor and then you started shaping canvases, right? And making ovals. Oh, there was a lot of things I did for the first time that a lot of people would, you know. When you didn't, they didn't have acrylic then. You know, that's an invention. And not everybody paints with acrylic. What were you painting with back then? Oil. Yeah, and you know, not only that, the government paid, you know, for, for me. And it, it, uh, right on the, by the way, I was where I first saw Picasso was at the, at the, where Sennelier's on Montparnasse, he was inside getting, you know, he had a Buick outside right there, and he was flirting with a, my best friend's girlfriend. And not, it had nothing to do with me, right? But I mean, that was something. I mean, it's, a, it's Picasso, right? He was hitting on it, right, you know? And uh, then I, and I met Brock, you know? And, uh, but then, then I don't know, the other you won't know too much about is, What's his name? The, uh, the who influenced me, it, and that influenced American art. Um, Nicola de Stal. I know some of you don't know who that is, but Nicola de Stal. I, I went. I went. I was in Paris, then, and then it's along that tomb. That's autumn time. They must have about a thousand people in there. But this instructor in Paris thought I was exceptional. He put me in a room, I'm in the middle of something, he's in the middle and then other people were on the side. And then here, this is what changed my life. So then I had a lot to do. I mean, nothing to do. I'd walk around. I looked at my painting, I couldn't figure out what the hell it was about. But I just kept looking at it. a big painting, but I didn't know what it was about. But all I did was think about that painting. They used to have a paper come out once a week called Art Spectacle. It came out on Wednesday. It's the format of the Times or something, but only about six pages. And there was that painting I'd seen in the Salon Vinton. It was reduced to this side, and then I saw what it was. It was, um, what, what was the figurative part of it? It was all figurative. You know, and and um, but it came to me. Wait, you know, I had painted the self-portrait you saw that three years before I ever went to Paris, right? Mm -hmm. And this guy, this stall. In other words, I liked what he did. They had other big names there. They even had Matisse and Picasso. They would always throw in one anyway. They're some of the greatest artists of all time. I'm not trying to put this stall with them, but you know. But anyway, I'd never seen anything like that. They said, why don't you, why don't you meet him? Well, anyway, I said, he said, well, it's in the catalog. They, everybody's address was in the catalog. And I looked in the catalog. I didn't see his name. And, but I saw him a couple of times, right? Real tall guys from Russia. Um, uh, what I say about that? He, he, and so, he, he you know, no, 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 but the, uh, 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 a girl at Le Monde has a critic, Michel Cornille Lacoste. He's the one who once was, he, he knew that I liked this stall. He said, why, why not Picasso and whatnot? I like Picasso not better than this stall, but, but he knew I was you know, influenced by him. Once I start painting like the stall, that changed the art history a little bit because I become famous and other people were influenced by the stall. It's just not a lot of uh, passionate colors and whatnot, right? You know, grays on gray. 
and, and like that. That changed me. Well, that's what people don't really know this, but Gestalt was to commit suicide over a woman, but yet that changed me. And then Not when, you, the, when no. you came back to New York after, when you came back to New York after you spent time in Europe. Yeah, you about, about you, five years. You Europe. helped open a gallery, a co-op gallery in New York, and you the, were... The, it, it, yeah, we brought a gallery. Brought a gallery is a word, a co-op gallery, and that's a word for, a Hungarian word or something for brothers. And they and, and they there they were, you know, Al Hill, uh, Yahweh Kusama got in because of me. You know that. Tell us about that. Well, first of all, she she uh, she, she wanted it because she couldn't get into those galleries, right? And so we would have a meeting every once in a while, and she was cute, and I was thinking, well, hey, I'll get her in there anyway. I didn't think much of her. But no, I'm just trying to say, because I'm going to change the mind. And that day that they had her show was afternoon. Well, all the artists went there, you know, they, there was silence. And then this guy, uh, what's his name? Earl Kirkham. That was an old American artist, way up there in his 80s. He looked at it from out in the street. He said, well, she sure know about space. I mean, all the, all the others, were, including me, action, boom, boom, boom. But there's with this little, that kind of thing, right? And she eventually, she, nothing happened for a while, and, but eventually she, she's one of the richest artists in the world now. I knew her very, very well. And you were also very good friends with Donald Judd, and you said you knew him when he was painting. What's that? Donald Judd. You said you knew him when he was painting. I knew him. We were in the same. We were in the same building on 19th Street and Park Avenue South. And Judd, Judd was was uh, he, yeah. We, we were very good. He's very, one of the most intelligent men I ever met. And he, it, we were right in the same building, and he. Uh, uh, he was allergic to turpentine. They didn't have acrylic then, right, you know. So then he changed to sculpture. And then, for, you know, it took him a while. And all of a sudden on 57th Street, they had a show, and he was uh, in it. His work, like a big box, a beautiful box. And, and I never, you know, just beautiful stuff. He was, he was one of the most dedicated, intelligent men, and we were very, very close. He did everything he could. He went to every gallery around to get me in. None of them would, would get me in. But then he showed me in his, in his own, he had a building, right, he had a show. But he, he, was, he was the most serious, real serious. I was working in Sidney Janice Gallery then, and I remember one time, he, w he wasn't known at all, but he came over and he wanted to see what was in the next show. I gave him the key to go into the basement. He did there, he stayed a long time. And he's like, he was very serious whatever he did. And one thing some people don't know, so one time, just as a friend, because he had, I was at Sidney Janice Gallery, he had a brown koozie uh, sculpture, you know, horizontal like a fish on a plate. Anyway, we, we're not going to steal nothing. But I got a piece of balsa wood, you know, and, and, and filed it down and filed it and gave it to him. All he needed was to put a mirror under it, right? Well, anyway, he got, he got he never, he said, I'm going to do something about it. But that's how close we were, right? And he appreciated it. He was not trying to say anything about it. But Brancusi was something like he, he liked. It nothing to do with me, but you know. But we, we were that close. And what about, what about Joan Mitchell? That's also somebody who, who you knew and, and spent time with in No, in jo Joan Mitchell was living in Paris. We, would get, we weren't married then, right? And, and this is, no, but anyway, all of a sudden Joan Mitchell who was sitting at a cafe across the street. We used to go to the cafe dome and whatnot. 
she mentioned that she's an artist in Washington. She got too racial, though. She started thinking about with blacks and like, like that. And she's from Chicago. I didn't think much of her. But then one day, look, things were very bad for us because I had no money. She invited me and whoever I was with out to Bay Toy. I've never seen a place that beautiful in my life. I mean, the Seine River you can see on Paris, they call it the snake. And there, you look down, it's not on the highway, but it's like this, right? She had a lot of money, and, but she was talented too, right? And we know all kinds of stories. So she, you know, I was, I was there for 18 months, and I won't tell you some other things about it, but anyway, we, <laughs> Joan, I didn't think much of her work, and that's my point. I didn't think much of her at all. But after she got, you know, she had a show in the, what's the name of the gallery that would smell a lot in New York City? Uh, uh, because because it wants the horse, the horse, it was near 57th Street, and the stable gallery, you know, like that. And she, she was, uh, you know, I didn't think much of her, she didn't think much of me. And, you know, but all of a sudden, uh, it was a time when her lover was Joan Paul Riopel, a Canadian. And so, she, in the meantime, when I first got there, she gave me some, you know, the paint. So I mean, I painted her a place a mm -hmm. little bit, and I did, but I finished it real fast. And then Real Pell said it's time for him to, mm -hmm. he saw some of my paintings in Gallery Raymond Cruz on mm -hmm. Avenue de Messine, you know, so then they, you know, I got into that gallery, Raymond Cruz. Mm -hmm. so, so, but she, uh, and I still didn't think much of it worked. But I do now, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> think much of it. I don't think she thought much of mine either. But she dug me a little bit, and I, you know, uh, so, but all that's a true story. Tell us, tell us who, you're, who, no. who were important artists, whose artists, or, you know, work do you really like, or who was really influential? You already mentioned a few, but when you were in New York, who were you sort of, who were your friends? Well, we all, we, well, we were by with. the way, the name Brada means brothers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that was all on 10th Street. That was a great thing happened on 10th Street because the night that, they, they had galleries there. And the night that it opened, all of them would say, well, let's open, you know, like 12, 12 galleries at once. In New York, it's something else, right? They, you couldn't get down the street on 10th Street. The, the people would just be there trying to get in. they just what's happening. And I remember one song, I was painting with oils, but this was another. All of a sudden, this, this guy had a, what, an overcoat that was really nice. And my painting was wet, and he got the paint on it. And then I heard him say, well, who's in a nice way? Who, who sues who? You know, that's kind of thing, right? You know, what <laughs> you go on 10th Street and ask for some money, right? So, uh, you know, all those guys, and they were good. You know, they were real good. Al Hill, uh, uh, and Ronnie Bladen. And, and you, you also tra you've traveled a lot. Yeah. And you've lived in different places. And some of the paintings on the wall you made in, in, in like that painting is from a New Orleans series. There's a painting from your China series. Do you paint when you're traveling or no, are but, the paintings but, but how that first started, look, you know Jack Whitten, huh? You or, know he's famous. Well, well <clears throat> he, he had a place in Crete. And so I knew him in New York, right? And so I went there and I, you know, and I just, I'm doing these kind of pastels. I'm not thinking about it. I stayed there a while and then went back to New York. And then people start asking me, what, you got any more of those from Crete? No, I'm abstract, see. Somehow I wasn't thinking about that. They could tell 
that if I traveled, I would change without thinking about it. Then I placed, and all these other guys were teaching college. I didn't have no degree, didn't care about that. While they were doing all that, I was able, because I made so many, to, to go everywhere I wanted. Allen, Martinique, uh, Nigeria, looking at the Ife stuff. And every time I'd go, Mexico, and all that kind of thing, it would change. I knew if I set myself in something, it, it, the vibes will come out, right? You know, like that. But, uh, and so I was making money and they were going to teaching. One thing, you know, I read about Picasso. We know he's, he's something else. He went to in Barcelona to school. He only, it's something he's supposed to take months. He did in about three weeks. And, you know, it's time to get out of there. So I was sort of the same way, you know, like all oh, that other stuff, right? You know, at these other places. I just stay so long and, and uh, yeah, I like Picasso. And you were, did, were you painting in these different in these different places? It was always, and I would let it just happen. I knew then all I needed to do was nothing except do what I'm trying to do. And when it's, when it, people would say, "Where, hey, where, where, where you, you know, you got one of those?" They talk about where. I mean, that was the, I was that sensitive to to being different places. So good thing I didn't just try to be in a studio. No, I'm lucky anyway. I got to New York City, and uh, I'm on the top floor. And, uh, and, and it just by chance, because when that thing, when I got it, it was like you couldn't even get in there. No, I mean, it was so bad and whatnot. And, you know, I stay there, but on the top floor, and, and you know, I make money. There, the top floor looking down on everything. Right? But the, and you, you paint with natural light, right? That's the other thing. Natural light is, that's another thing about Paris. Paris is not, it's Swiss sky. You take New York, some of the greatest artists in the world, but they don't have natural light to it. Paris has those shorter buildings and they're all natural light. Right, and that's a different kind of color. I can tell the difference right away. I don't know if it's necessary, but it's absolutely different. If you if you paint, uh, you know, now New York City is the number one in the world. We know that, so I'm not knocking it. I don't know. But, a, no, no. I don't know if everybody from no, no, would agree. No, 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 no. But 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 uh, it doesn't matter if. Maybe on the top floor, the first floor in New York. I happen to be on the top floor, though, the and, top floor. And your studio has natural light now, right? Well, but the moment I moved there, it was natural light because I'm on the top floor. You know, it's a 12-story building. I was and still in it, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, are you still painting these days? Do I what? Do you still paint? I can show you my, the paint on my clothes if you want to see it. <laughs> what else do you think I do? <laughs> right, yeah, no, that's all I do. And if I don't go to the paint, I'll do to the uh, drawings or something, right, uh, paper, but always, you know, Deb and I just go for what else would I do? Right. And are you still painting with a broom, or are you, or are you painting? The painting for the ways? broom is is unbelievable. What I did with the broom, and if you think about what I've done, right? How can you paint with a broom? Okay, I can see these. Some of these, the paint's wet. It has to be wet. And you know, but you can't turn it up because it'll pour down, right? So I get into, you know, like that, like, like that. So, it, it, and some artists don't know it was down. They try to do it, they can't do it because gravity, mm -hmm. gravity's there. And, and, and a lot of these are about that, right, you know. Like, it, and this book on uh, the tilting gallery, you got one of the tilting? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Ed, have you, have you um, uh, shown, you just had a recent show at Tilton and they showed your work with pieces by Judd and Kusama and other people. 
that you knew or used to work with, but some of the paintings that were in that show that aren't in this one were a little bit more like sort of like this, where it wasn't necessarily just the broom stroke, but they, there was a little bit more intuitive sort of mark making. Um, how, how do you make these? But what let me tell you, room? first of all, the only way to make a painting like this. Let me, I'm going to show it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The only way to make a painting like that that's wet is going to drip down unless you leave it, right? Now, here's the other thing about it. That people see this. This is also like unconsciously the Big Bang, the beginning, you know, of time. You know, it starts with this and then it explodes. I'm not just painting, you know, I don't paint that I want this blue and whatnot. I let it happen. Boom. But, you know, and it has to be on the floor. So you have to paint on the floor. There's no other way to do it. No other way. You can just take that broom and I'm the, it, they say I invented the broom too, you know, and, and think about that. That's a, and and yeah. the, the painting in the back wall there, from 1952, it's called The City. And it's yeah. very, very different from the other ones. Yeah, well. Can you tell us a little bit of, I know that that was. Well, there, there, there comes in Nicola de Stahl again, right? Nicola de Stahl, uh, I'd seen his paintings in the Salon Platon. And then I, I liked the man. Right, you know, and I told him because he, I, I, you know, I wasn't able to get him because I, because they stall or something, not, you know, mm -hmm. and so, uh, and then I, then all of a sudden when I started painting this one, I don't know why, I started painting a city. I never do that. And then probably I got frustrated and then I just started of try to destroy it, right? Now, if you look at at that side there to the left, and I'm not religious, but that was part of a church. It once was a cross. And then all of a sudden in the middle, I just said like, just real fast, start painting, oh, just no matter what, you know. Boom, 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 <laughs> like that. And that painting, you know, we got a lot of money for that. That painting now, and then we then I bought it back from this guy who had a lot of money. I paid a lot of money for that. My my daughter, stand up, my daughter. She oh she she owns that and every other painting. She's got some of the best paintings I ever did, and she will not sell anything. Warning, <laughs> just Nothing. get it on camera. Well, you're not allowed to sell it. But um. anything, she won't sell it. And well, first of all, she's a big time lawyer, you know. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> and so when, why did you decide to, to start making work that was more abstract instead of trying you to You know, make look, it's got to be more. unconscious. I mean, you know, all great art, you know, the artist may not have thought about it. Let's it, it let it happen, right? You know, all of a sudden it happened. Now in Paris, the, the number one newspaper in integrity in Paris called Le Monde. And all of a sudden, I made something in Paris. And on Boulevard Raspi, they just they decided a big, big place that to give the Americans a show or something, even though that was an American place. So anyway, it's a Grand Toile de Montparnasse. I mean, big works. So I was in the show. And all of a sudden, I forgot about it. Then Le Monde came out. And two things happened. He put it in Le Monde. But here, the part I didn't like, it's a, a French, not that I ever knew French too well, but it said, this, uh, how did they put it in, in Le Monde? Yeah, if it, Cornel Lacoste was a critic, real okay. big snob critic, right? And when he came one time, he it was in this American Center. He'd seen it as a critic. And then when he finally met me to see that, because it, he said, "I don't say this often." 
and I'm sitting in the select, and he said, I said, you're younger than I thought. He said, and you're not as black as I thought, in English, right? Okay, so and then, but he knew that he'd seen something different. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets in Lamont, right? I was the writer. I mean, I was the one every time, every month, they'd write about mm -hmm. me in Lamont. So this gallery there, Gary Raymond Cruz, uh, was, was a big time Gary. I was in there for, for years, right? So that got in. Uh, I've had big success in Paris, uh, and I have starved in Paris, right? And I wouldn't leave it no matter what, right? And I love the place. And I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to see if the audience has yeah, anything yeah. else. But you were making the piece that's behind us, you, we see the shape of the oval, but you made paintings that were shaped. I saw there's a big circle painting in your studio now. Um, and you used to make the art, the art Institute, there's pieces that are not sort of traditional sort of canvases. How did you, why did you start making canvases in different shapes? I don't think they look too much different shapes. It's a circle of, one thing here you see though that I did learn by some other guy who was an artist over there. I didn't know, I wanted to make an oval, just for rum, you know, and I made some ovals. But I didn't really know how to make it until this other guy, an American, happened to be, knew how you put two nails in a string. When you put the two nails in the string, if you put one nail in a loop, you make a perfect circle. If you make two, it can't be sir, because you mess with it, it began to get elliptical, see, like that. And then, and not only that, is that a, it's, a, it's better than if you use a projector, because if you use a projector to make an oval, it's a distortion, but if you got the string right down, it is absolutely the end of the line, right, because you're pulling it right around as an oval. And I began to do a lot of ovals and made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. If you make an oval, <laughs> you know, you better know what you're doing. <laughs> We're gonna wrap up here and Ed's gonna be around so you can ask him questions. Um, yeah. He'll be here for a little while. Thank you everybody for coming and please make sure you also see Matsumi Kanamitsu's exhibition. Um, both of the shows will be up through December 20th. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay.